I wish you could see how beautiful you look from up here. There are a lot of you here, and our understanding is that there are still some more folks in the parking lot who would like to join us. And so if you would like to increase your chances of making a new friend this Christmas Eve, we would love it if folks could, there's a technical term which is squish. If you could squish a little bit toward this side of the sanctuary, if there is space on your pew, then we will make room for more to experience the joy of Christmas Eve.
Light looked down and saw darkness. Peace looked down and saw war. Love looked down and saw hatred. So the Lord of light, the Prince of peace, the King of love came down and crept in beside us.
My sisters and brothers, I hope that you can sense the radiant joy of this night. I hope that you can feel the presence of God and the power of hope in a new way. Surrounded by family, friends, strangers, and fellow travelers, we have come to celebrate the wonder of Christmas. You are all welcome in this place. Whether you worship here every week, drop by on occasion, come from many miles away, or have never been here before, you are welcome here. If your heart is full of joy, you are welcome here. If your spirit is broken, you are welcome here. If your mind is wandering, you are welcome here. If tonight you are surrounded by those you love, or if you are all alone, you are welcome here. For tonight we do not seek explanation, we open our hearts and minds and souls to the mystery of our faith. Welcome to Second Presbyterian Church, and to this service of song, scripture, and candlelight. On this night, may Emmanuel come again to you, to us, to all the world. Welcome. Let us pray. God of all time and space, long ago you sent your angels through the midnight of a sleeping world to tell the shepherds Christ was born in Bethlehem. Come to our dark world this night and stir our hearts to hear again their message of your love. O God of joy, on this night of expectant wonder, we tread again the path to Bethlehem, to the child whose birth was heralded by prophets, proclaimed by angels, and welcomed by shepherds. Open our eyes to see in that infant your loving purpose and stir within us the spirit of praise. Embracing God in the quietness of this hour, touch our understanding with your spirit that we may know again the wonder of your love in Jesus Christ. And though there was no room in Bethlehem's end, help us to make room in the busyness of the world so that our lives may show Christ's love and our hearts receive Christ's peace. So come, Emmanuel, so come, thou long-expected, much-anticipated Jesus. O come, all ye faithful, come to Bethlehem, come to the stable, come and worship, come and adore, for God is with us. Amen. A reading from the prophet Isaiah. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. You have multiplied the nation, you have increased its joy. They rejo rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as people exult when dividing plunder. For the yoke of their burden, and the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For all the boots of the tramping warriors and all the garments rolled in blood shall be burned as fuel for the fire. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish it and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time onward and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts We'll do this.
A second reading from the prophet Isaiah. A shoot shall come out from the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. His delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity the meek of the earth. And he shall strike the earth with a rod of his mouth. And the wolf shall live with the lamb. And the leopard shall lie down with the kid. And the calf and the lion and the fatling together. And a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze. Their young shall lie down together. And the lion shall eat straw like the ox. And the nursing child shall play over the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea.
reading from the Gospel of Luke. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, how can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God.
On this sacred night, we receive an offering to bring light to others who are in need. We do this through the Christmas joy offering of our denomination, which supports students, pastors, missionaries, and church servants who find themselves in special need. With gratitude, let us dedicate and present our offerings to God. Please join me in prayer. God of holy nights, as we offer our gifts, gather them up to be the hope for all who struggle, food for those who hunger, shelter for those who sleep rough, life for all who yearn. In Jesus' name, amen.
A reading from the Gospel of Luke. In those days, a decree went out from the Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. And this was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. And Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the city of David, called Bethlehem, because he was descended from the house in the family of David. And he went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. reading from the Gospel of Luke. In that region there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, For see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth 
and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace among those whom he favors. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds had told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. A reading from the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and without Him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in Him was life. And that life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but came to testify to the light, the true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, 
he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood or of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but of God. And the Word became flesh and lived among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. I am persuaded, absolutely convinced, that five-year-olds have supersonic hearing and superhuman vision when any kind of surprise is involved. I promise our son Samuel can hear the rustling of candy wrappers from several rooms away that he suddenly tunes in whenever treats are being discussed, even if we are careful to spell out the pertinent words I-C-E-C-R-E-A-M. 
It's a well-known tradition. It plays out from one generation to the next. As the gifts begin to arrive in the home, the children return to, to all the familiar hiding places, and the parents desperately try to find new ones each year. I distinctly remember my older sister positioning me at the corner of the hallway as lookout to my parents' bedroom door while she explored under the bed, behind the dresser, and in the closet, even the tall shelves, which required stepping on the chair in the corner. It does seem that the intuitive sense of children is heightened as Christmas approaches. We seem to come equipped with both the capacity and the desire to seek out presence. And I think it is this desire and capacity that has drawn us together on this holy night. Though it is a different kind of presence that we hope to find. We are here, whether for the first time or as part of an annual tradition that spans decades, because we want to experience the promise of Christmas. We've come hoping to feel a, a deep sense of God's presence, deeper than the pain and the grief and the apathy that threaten to divide us. And I think we've come to the right place. Several years ago, on December 23rd, Scott Black Johnston, pastor of Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church in New York City, wrote a column for the Wall Street Journal. The column was titled, Welcome Once a Year Parishioners. Scott begins by observing that on Christmas Eve, most churches are guaranteed a full house in worship. Tomorrow night, he writes, the church will be full. Some will come out of habit, harboring nostalgia for the night. Some will act out of courtesy, yes, Grandma, I'll go with you. Some will be here because they enjoy the music of the season. Scott also notes that, that many pastors, while resenting the awkwardness of the night and the unfamiliarity of many worshipers, choose this holy moment to chastise people for not being in worship the other 51 weeks of the year. I would never dream of doing such a thing. He suggests a different response. Wonder, amazement, gratitude. He is convinced, as am I, that our gathering tonight is a sign of the hope we still hold, a hope that God will show up. He writes, this is the core of religion, the thing that, that binds us together, the thing that we humans haven't yet managed to squash, the expectation that something momentous might happen when we gather. That's why people will turn out for worship on Christmas Eve. They will come to see if, if angels are going to show up and proclaim that there is a God who loves us and that heaven's great desire for the world is peace. And you are here tonight, I believe, because you are aware of your own need for presence not the gifts that we excitedly exchange, rapidly unwrap, and quickly forget. Try to remember a gift you received five years ago on Christmas. But the divine presence that gives meaning to our struggle and hope when we need it the most. It is the promise of that presence that brings us together. That's why we gather to hear a story we already know. To sing words we all remember, to see faces aglow with candlelight, to light those candles piercing the darkness, to pause and breathe and be fully present on this one holy night when anything seems possible. 
On this night, I think we do best to follow the lead of of children unable to contain their wonder or surprise who sing the words they know by heart with reckless exuberance. If you were here at four o'clock this afternoon, you would have heard them go tell it on a mountain, over the hills and everywhere, squealing voices of amazement that could not be contained in this space. And that's the gospel writer John. He he couldn't contain his amazement either. And so even though his Christmas story contains no angels or wise men, no shepherds watching their flocks by night, no manger, no stable, it captures the wonder of this night beautifully. His gospel begins in the beginning. All of creation came into being through the one of whom he now sings. And so John tells a story that spans all of time. It is the story of the love of God for the world. And then at just the right moment, John proclaims the Messiah's birth in poetic pronouncement, and the Word became flesh and lived among us, and we saw His glory. That Word present at the commencement of creation comes to make home in human history. As the late Eugene Peterson put it in his wonderful paraphrase, the message, the word became flesh and blood and it moved into the neighborhood. Just the right time. The Apostle Paul called it the fullness of time. God crept into our world of sin and sorrow to break the grip of evil and save us from ourselves from all the demonic forces that deface the image of God in us and others. On one night of all nights, God entered the world in the form of an infant child. He looked like us, and yet in him we got a permanent glimpse of God. God came close enough to touch God with us. The Word of God became flesh and lived not apart from us, but among us. If it is true, it is the most important of all truth. If it is not true, it is of all truths the one that people most want to be true if they can make it so. On Friday evening, Sarah and I continued an annual Christmas tradition that began back in Atlanta, going to see Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol this year at the Indiana Repertory Theater. The power of that story never ceases to move me. And then there is that final scene. After the visits from the ghosts of Christmas past, present, and future, after the realization that he had it all wrong all along, Ebenezer Scrooge wakes from his slumber. He rushes to the window of his room, flings open the shutters. What day is today? He calls out to a child on the street. Christmas Day, the boy shouts back. Scrooge is ecstatic. Dickens writes, the bedpost was his own, the bed was his own, the room was his own, but best and happiest of all, the time before him was his own. Time to make amends in. You see, Christmas comes in the fullness of time. Never too late to receive the gift. John calls that gift grace upon grace. The light that shines in the darkness, the way, the truth, the life, it comes in the tiny, compact package of human flesh and blood we call a baby. Why did God choose incarnation? Why that moment? 
Why in the form of a a vulnerable infant? Why risk the pain of human life and, and the brokenness of a world gone astray? Why? I'll tell you why. Because that is what love does. Love appears in flesh and bone. Love shows up. A couple of weeks ago, I had lunch with a member of this congregation who three years ago had a stroke that continues to impact his life in profound ways. On our way to lunch, he described to me what happened after the stroke. He said, some people drifted away and and became distant out of their, their own discomfort or maybe their embarrassment. But other people drew closer, began showing up and offering rides to appointments, calling on the phone to see what he might need, sitting for hours in waiting rooms as the road to recovery began slowly. Those people, he said, are the ones I call angels. That's what love does. When a baby is born, when a, when a loved one dies, when disaster strikes, when human beings are treated in inhuman ways, when justice is denied, when hearts are broken, love shows up. Sometimes we who receive this gift struggle to accept it. When our first son was born, I remember repeating over and over again to family, friends, neighbors, and church members, you don't have to do that. I said it most often to my (laughs) mother-in-law. She showed up when Samuel was five days old, and she offered so many amazing gifts to our family. Meals would appear, the kitchen would be clean when we woke up, the laundry washed, dried, and folded. You don't have to do that, I would say. You don't, you don't have to do that. I, I said it over and over again. I said it so many times. You don't have to do that, and I was dead wrong. It is exactly what she had to do. Love required it. That's what love does. Love shows up when it is most needed and it gets to work. As the Grinch tells us, it comes without ribbons, it comes without tags, it comes without packages, boxes, or bags. It just shows up. In the fullness of time, when the moment is right, love shows up. And that, my brothers and sisters, is why we are here. That is why this night happened. That is why we have gathered in this sanctuary and what we have come to celebrate. That love showed up. That we have seen its glory full of grace and truth. That God did not miss that moment. On this night, when it was cold and the world was too busy to even notice, God showed up, could be nowhere else. Love required it. In just a moment, we will receive the gift of light and pass that light throughout this sanctuary. Each candle, a symbol of God's presence, overcoming the deep darkness giving witness to a deeper hope. It is the promise of presence that we celebrate this night. It may not seem like much when our fears are so strong and the night seems so dark, but here is the truth. Because of that promise, because of that light, nothing is impossible. It's Christmas. Receive the gift of hope. Shine the light of Christ. Believe this promise. 
God shows up. Amen.
This night, a child is born to us. Light has pierced the darkness and the world has been forever tilted in the direction of love and hope and faith. Therefore, go out into the world with joy in the simple truth of this night that God is with us now and forever. And the grace of Bethlehem's holy child, the love of God who never ceases to amaze us, and the fellowship of the Spirit who is always doing a new thing will be with you this holy night and forevermore. Amen.